so we have a little bit of time. Um, we meet together as this uh, electronic Sangha. The sangha indicates a quality of being together, that our aim is to find uh, harmony and inclusion free of competition and conflict and division. And today we'll cover quite a lot of material uh, around impermanence. And uh, we can listen mainly in two ways. The first is just to be open to whatever you hear, receiving it and releasing it. The sound comes and goes, comes and goes. And in that way, we remain fresh in each moment. Of course, we can also approach uh, Dharma in the other way, which is to try to accumulate knowledge. And we can think that some bits are more important than others. And in that way, we gather together uh, uh, an accumulation of concepts. Mm -hmm. From the point of view of Sokshen, Dharma concepts and uh, worldly concepts are just concepts. Knowing a lot about Dharma is not necessarily helpful. So when we listen in the first way, we can become aware of our tendency to judge. You're hearing sound, you interpret it according to your understanding of language. This is your mental activity. The sound itself is there as a potential. How we take it up, how we work with it, is our freedom or our limitation. Our main point of study is our own mind. This is not something uh, narrow or limited or narcissistic, because it's only by uh, being with your own mind that you realize that your mind is not yours. As long as we <clears throat> merge with the thoughts and memories and plans which arise in our mind, we maintain the ego sense of mastery, of being in charge. And out of the vastness of the field of potential, we make our selection, which the, the kind of selection that confirms our sense of who we are. In this way, we never find out the true basis of our presence. Okay, so each of you is sitting wherever you are. Breathing in and breathing out. Breath is life and breath is impermanent. This is fundamental. Our existence is inseparable from a flow of uh, pulsation with coming in, going out. The uh, castle of the self, the fortress of the self, is built on the wind. This is very strange. How can it be that all that I think I am, that I know that I am, is resting simply on the movement of life through me? Similarly, our heartbeat is life, and the heartbeat is impermanent, it's dynamic. Without that pulsation, we would not be alive. When we just stay present with our life as it is, then we can see that there is no fixed entity there. The phenomena are always moving. Impermanence is life itself. Life manifests as part of the impermanence of the field of experience. This is something quite amazing. It's something that we avoid because we want to build up a sense of who we are. Well, of course, construction is also an activity. So we have uh, stillness and movement. When we uh, experience the world through our senses, we experience movement. Colors, sounds, shapes, smells, and so on. Moreover, uh, our thoughts are impermanent, as are our feelings and our sensations. Of course, what we call a sensation is a concept. If you do vipassana meditation practice, you become aware that the body reveals itself as transient sensation. You can be present with the arising and passing of moment and moment and moment of this arising uh, impingement, something which uh, 
comes in contact with your presence. It's there and then it's gone. Once you take that um, emergent, simple presence and wrap it in further identifications based on concepts, you start to feel the solidity of the event. So the solidity of our experience arises from excess. And when you have the juxtaposition of the transient phenomena and the transient conceptualization, this creates the illusion of some kind of enduring essence. But of course, we believe in the illusion. The freshness of the moment is hidden by our attempt to make sense of it. Now, you probably read this and heard this many, many times. The question then is, how come we don't get it moment by moment? That somehow we are tilted into the fantasy of the stabilization of the field of experience. That we have a, a recognition of things which are there. So we can take recognition as a kind of knowing again. That there is something there which we can know again because it, we've known the same thing before. Or you can see, oh, again, I am adding cognition. I have access to a wide range of concepts which I can apply to the emergent field. And each time I apply them, I have the solidification. If you observe for yourself, you maybe will see that this is true. That the delusion is that we are seeing self-existing entities which are there in their substantial solidity. And this feeds into our idea that the world is there before we arrive. Now, of course, we have the sense, my mom was there before I was born. If she hadn't been there, how would I have arisen? There is a dependent origination. On the basis of my mum, here I am. But what is mum? You have some memories of your mother. You imagine that there is a mother apart from your memories. But if you discuss your mother with your brother or sister, you find they don't have exactly the same mum. Both of you spend so many years with this woman called mum, but somehow you have different mums. These small facts of life are very important. My mother is my idea about my mother. My mother is ungraspable. Whatever I can say about her is not the whole truth. But I believe that my uh, perception of her is accurate. This is, uh, in Buddhism, what is meant by uh, dullness or mental obscuration that instead of seeing my mother, I imagine my mother. And on the basis of that, because I imagine her in a way different from my brother, it is as if we have different mothers. In this uh, dullness or confusion or opacity arises because of this streaming together of these uh, two aspects of direct perception and conceptual interpretation. So when you pay attention to politics or economics or art criticism, you see that people have very different ideas. They see the same painting, but they have different experiences. That is to say, our experience is mediated through our own conceptual structure. We never see the painting itself. We never saw our mother as she actually was. We don't see our friends as they actually are. We don't see the trees or the vegetables as they actually are. And we certainly don't see ourselves as we actually are. When we sit in the meditation and we become aware of the ceaseless flow of experience, this flow is not establishing anything. It's present and undeniable, but uncatchable. And yet, 
when we mediate that experience through our concepts, it is as if we can take hold of things. So this is a basic uh, Buddhist understanding, which uh, is very helpful if we can be clear about it. Things don't exist out there in and of themselves. Things arise for us according to our way of participation. So our sense of our past is a flow of memories and thoughts. Um, and these thoughts elaborate the memory. When we think about the future, that's also composed of our thoughts and feelings and sensations. Now with this virus, when the period of uh, shutdown has, uh, is lifting, we go out into the street with a certain degree of suspicion. Are these people dangerous? We have thoughts. We can't uh, take some blood from them and analyze it quickly. So what the other person is for us depends on our interpretation. And we cling to ideas, oh, maybe children are safer than old people. We don't know. When we listen to the scientists discussing, they have many ideas. Does nobody know? No, nobody knows. We will find out, perhaps. So this is very interesting. We can see how we send out our thoughts like uh, spies into the world to check out what is the shape, what is the topology of this field of experience. So our present moment is not something new and fresh, but is a field in which many uh, hopes and fears, many forms of interpretation are moving. So it's like uh, if, you, if we have water, water flows easily. And if you have uh, the fine flower of arrowroot, if you have the flower in your hand, it will just pour out because it just it moves like sand. And water also flows. But when you bring these two together, it sets. It settles down into this uh, fixed shape. Two easily moving forms create a stable form. It is, this, uh, it is because of this that we do meditation practice. Because in meditation, we have a chance to have these two streams slightly separate. Our interpretation, we start to see, is coming after the arising of the sensation. For example, there is a sensation and then there is the interpretation. The sensation by itself is clearly vanishing, just by itself. But once the interpretation is poured close to the preceding thought, which has already vanished, it is as if you get this uh, solid formation. This is the birth of the world of things. This is how we come to experience ourselves as a thing, an entity in a world of things. So the, the root of suffering, as the Buddha explained, arises from grasping. Now, it's easy enough to understand this on an outer level. We grasp at our possessions maybe at friends or lovers, we grasp at our body. And inside that level of grasping, it seems obvious, oh yes, I have a body. But when we get a bit sick, we realize we were not in charge of our body. Our body didn't ask us permission to get sick. We find ourselves being sick. The old body is a, a field of emergent experience which runs in parallel with the arising or the emerging of thoughts, memories, and so on. So the body as flow, as the flow of blood, of hormones, of, and the flow of our thoughts about our body, flow together to form this uh, jelly formation. It seems to settle. I have a body. This is undeniable. What is it? It's my body. When we say it's my body, this is like the public relations department of the president. 
this aspect of our mind is trained to be deceitful. I exist. That's obvious. If you don't agree, it's a sign you're stupid. You want to investigate further? Oh, so you are stupid and now you want to make me stupid. I say, no, I exist. That's enough. So in that way, when we sit inside the belief that our concepts tell the truth about how life is, it is dark, obscure. So sometimes Vipassana is, ex is uh, translated as insight meditation. It indicates seeing truly. It indicates seeing how it is rather than how you imagine it is. So hopefully you start to see how vital the understanding of impermanence is. At first, when we know something of impermanence, it's like a tool for loosening up the solidity of the world. Because then we can investigate the various phenomena we see and uh, realize that they are compounded, that they are arising due to causes and conditions. They don't have an essence of their own. For example, if you look at a motor car, the car is there. You look at it, it's obvious, it's a car. Does the car have an essence? Is there some truth within it which is the basis of the manifesting of car? Is there a carness to the car? So the car is put together from many parts. It has the engine, the wheels, the chassis, the basic uh, foundational shape that holds it together. If you don't have any wheels, then the wheels are the most important. If you don't have an engine, then and, oh, the engine is the most important. But there is no, even if we look again and again, what we see is the working together, the dynamic operating together of these factors, which generate, they, they generate a formation onto which we can put the idea of car. What makes the car a car is the idea of car. If you walk around the car, then from each point, it's like, like a sculpture and it reveals different shapes, shadow formations and so on. So generally we think that the car is made in the factory. This is not true. The car is made with your mind. If you really engage with this idea, it's very, very radical. People go to the car showroom and they spend a lot of money to be able to bring home a car. So clearly, they wouldn't give their money for nothing. They got something, but maybe in the car showroom, they had 10 different kinds of car. They chose a car because they have some sense of the purpose for long journeys or short journeys, going on flat roads or going in the country, according to the amount of money available. Do I want it to be red or silver? These are choices. The car doesn't make the choice. The mind makes the choice. In this world, you cannot find even one thing which is separate from the mind. This is uh, not a dogma. This is not something you should believe. This is something to investigate. You can look at it everywhere you go. Birds, trees, dogs, bread, cheese. You look and you see qualities. Some people like strong cheese, some people like a soft cheese. And of course, sometimes you like a soft cheese and sometimes you like a strong cheese. The world is revealed with the mind. And as we'll come to see, the world and mind are not two things that are brought together. The world emerges as our experience. Whatever the world might be, in itself, we have no access to it. We have various uh, methods or paradigms of investigation which reveal interpretations. The mind is always there. So the Buddha taught this many, many times in different ways. The mind is chief. This is the basis for our potential for awakening or enlightenment. If 
all we had was our opinion about the world, a world of things, then the limit of our progress would be uh, our capacity to make good choices rather than bad choices. And we would be trapped by our socio-political economic situation. We would have the view from here, influenced by gender, age, health, wealth, and so on. But when we realize we're not just having an opinion about real things, and we start to see, oh, that view itself is deluded. And we see, oh, the mind is the basis. Liberation doesn't lie in the object. You don't need to go to Mount Kailash. You don't need to go anywhere. If you are here and not dead, then you have a mind. And that mind is the basis for the display or the experience of everything that occurs. So it's vital that we start to understand the mind. Our mind is very changeable. Somebody says something sweet to us and we feel happy. Someone is critical about us, we feel sad or angry. So just as I say, I have a body, this body is mine, and yet I'm not in control of whether I get sick or not. So with the mind, although I say it is my mind, I am not deciding what will arise in my mind, not in terms of memories or plans, not in terms of uh, sensations or feelings. So we, when we look in this way, we start to see the mind is not a possession. My mind is not something I have, but rather it's the other way around. The mind shows me. What I call I, me, myself, is the emergence of uh, moments of the mind, qualities of the mind. So if I stay inside my false reification of the patterns of experience, then I ignore the dynamic process of the unfolding of the experience of life. Okay, so we take a, a break for 20 minutes now. Good. See you. Okay. <clears throat> so when we are simply present, that is just this, 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 this is silent and it doesn't move because when we're present in each moment, it's just this. But when our mental activity begins, when we raise a question like, what is this? Or come to a conclusion, this is that, then we are in movement. This movement can come into sound. It has something to say. We say, oh, it's hot today. We seem to establish something. In fact, of course, when we say it is hot today, this is movement. Movement of sound and movement of conceptual linking. Now, if we get up in our room and we want to dance and move around, how we can move is influenced by the furniture. In the same way, the movement of our mind is influenced by our furniture, by the belief systems that we have, uh, trauma formations, expectations, and so on. So th there's nothing wrong with the movement itself. It's simply that movement is particularly delicious for the ego. Silence, stillness, unchanging <laughs> openness. This is the, the field, the, 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 the space of awareness. But the ego likes something to be happening. So we have many different ways of becoming distracted. Who is distracted? No one is distracted. But that sounds stupid. Because I get distracted. We all know what that's like. I was doing this or being aware in this way, and then I was lost in something else. But who went from here to there? 
the package of thought, feeling, and sensation, which manifests itself as I, me, myself. So that's why in our practice again and again, we have to look, is there any substantial essence or basis to the felt sense of I, me, myself? Because if we are not clear about the emptiness of the self, then our Dharma practice can become itself a method of confusion. So, for example, Dharma activity is movement. It could be cleaning your altar, filling water bowls. You might want to change the water in the offering bowls. We want to offer fresh water to the Buddha. Now, one of the qualities of the Buddha is equanimity. If the water is fresh or stale, doesn't matter. But we have the idea, oh, we have to offer something fresh and good and beautiful. When I lived in uh, my teacher, Siya Lama's house in Bengal, he had a wonderful hedge down one side of the garden with many uh, beautiful flowers. It's a beautiful little five petal flower, uh, which is uh, special for Shiva. So every morning early on, many people would come and pick the flowers to take home to do their puja to offer to Shiva. So Sialama Rinpoche used to ask, well, is the sin of stealing flowers compensated by the virtue of offering to Shiva? Because when we put on the blinkers of our sense of what is important, Inside our frame of reference, we make our hierarchy of values. So, generally speaking, the basic Buddhist teachings are concerned with outcome. We want to gain enlightenment. We don't have it, and we'd like to get it. And luckily, the Buddha taught the method for getting it. So then, uh, Dharma practice becomes a means to an end. It becomes instrumental which means it is dualistic. I will act on myself in order to change myself into a Buddha. But then we're in the business of construction. And all compounded things, all created things are impermanent. So the Dharma activity may be a means of creating a good karma, but it's not the path of liberation because uh, karma means activity which is based on the discrimination of good and bad. So then we are doing our dharma from the point of view of starting with our own frame of reference. I start with my assumptions about what is good and bad. So if you have in your kitchen a banana which is starting to become a little bit rotten, you probably don't think, oh, this is the perfect banana for the Buddha. No, Buddha needs a fresh banana because I like the fresh bananas and the Buddha and me, we're like twins. What I like, the Buddha likes. So this is called the, the Dharma practice of the cause. That is used to say you start from where you, <clears throat> from your conceptual identification of where you are and then you proceed to change and develop yourself to become different. Now, we also have the other way of practice, which is to practice with the result. We identify directly with the Buddha. Then we're just with how it is. Whether you do this with a tantric flavor, that everything is within the mandala of the Buddha, or within a view of Mahamudra or Dzogchen, where you're di directly... Uh, present in awareness, which is the ground of experience. Here, the, here we sit with our open awareness, without judgment, without evaluation of uh, useful or unuseful. And so whatever comes, well, that's what's here. Whatever goes, oh, that's gone. It doesn't matter. That is to say, the semantic content, the conceptual content of what is arising is not the main point. 
what we experience is the flow of energy moving like this, moving like that. We are not moving with the movement. Awareness, like the sky, is the medium through which all the thoughts, feelings, memories, and so on come and go. And then, when we arise from sitting practice, we see that uh, the kitchen is arising in the mind. In the trees, and the cars, and the birds, this is mm -hmm. the mind. They are moving. When the mind is calm, although experience is coming and going, nothing is moving. That is to say, nothing, emptiness, is moving, but because it is nothing, there is no movement nothing to grasp but we are here and our body is a mode of participation in this flow of experience so the movement of the body in the, movement, in the space of movement becomes a space within which there is the movement of non-movement so say for example you were to do something like uh, making prostrations which is a dharma activity in the Tibetan tradition, there's often a requirement that you should do this as part of the basic uh, preparation. So you have to do at least 100,000 prostrations. So you could do this with uh, an intention to increase faith, to complete a requirement which is necessary for progression on the path in order to help you be mindful of the flow. These are all dualistic in their structure. That is to say, I am going to do something for a purpose. The starting point is dissatisfaction. This is dualistic because I am doing something for a purpose. So we are, have another way of doing prostrations, which is just to be in the flow. You are not thinking about it. There is no intention, no commentary, no concern with outcome. There's nothing to gain. Nowhere is better than here. And we are already here. And if we're not here, trying to be somewhere else will not help us to be here. So impermanence helps us to see that the idea of constructing a better place is a delusion, but it's a holy delusion, an ethical delusion, because it organizes our life energy in a direction which doesn't cause trouble for other people. Who is doing what and why? So who is me? Who am I? I am the one doing this. Why? Because it's what I have to do because the teacher said it's necessary. Okay. So I should believe what I'm told. This sounds like switch off your own light and try to get the light of someone else. So, so why did the Buddha say, be a lamp unto yourself? Where is your light? I don't know, but that person has light. Maybe they will give me a light. I have the potential, I have a cigarette, but they don't have any matches. Please give me a light. Which is more important, the cigarette or the light? But the Buddha is self-illuminating. The Buddha is not a cigarette and not a match. Everything which arises is impermanent. Impermanence dissolves hopes and fears. Well, what will I do with my life? If I shouldn't be trying to be a better person, if I'm not to be accumulating merit and wisdom, what will I do? Do nothing. Every ego is very dangerous. The best ego is a sleeping ego. So, good night and sleep well. You sing a little lullaby to your ego. We have many lullabies in Dharma. You have Tara, 
lullabies, Padmasambhava lullabies. That is the purpose of doing a puja. Sit still, little ego. Nothing for you to do. Everything is fine. This is the teaching of Samantabhadra, the primordial Buddha. So it's not that you shouldn't do Dharma activity, but it helps to find out who is doing the Dharma activity. There are many different kinds of teachers of Dharma, for example. Some don't say very much. Some say a lot. Some are like monks and live very regulated lives. Others are not. They have irregular lives. They are unconventional, unpredictable. Which is the best kind of teacher? That depends. It depends on you. The answer doesn't lie in the object. Judging the teacher won't help you. Judging yourself won't help you. Being aware of how you are, that might help you. When you have maybe, <clears throat> excuse me, a sequence of <clears throat> negative thoughts, you might uh, <clears throat> have a thought, oh, I'm a bad person. I shouldn't have thoughts like this. So two things. Which is the chicken and which is the egg? Do I have bad thoughts because I'm a bad person? Or does having bad thoughts make me a bad person? Where do the thoughts come from? I'm sure good people don't have these kind of thoughts. It's my thought arising in my mind. I must be a bad person to have these thoughts. That's a very interesting point of view. Because... In our mind, many, many thoughts arise. Some of the thoughts, we have no idea why we're thinking them. So where are these thoughts coming from? Maybe some black magician is putting them into us. Maybe the thoughts are coming out of the light bulb. Maybe, indeed, we are psychotic. I have thoughts I didn't make. That's too disturbing. Much better to think I have bad thoughts because I'm a bad person. Now I know who I am. Now I have to try to be a good person. This is how we put ourselves back in prison. So I, I experience the arising of thoughts, sensations, feelings, which I didn't intend to have. Where did they come from? They arrived here. If I merge into them, it is as if they are me. But they're not thoughts I would want. <clears throat> so the not me becomes me by me believing that this is me. This is how I construct my sense of self. According to my way of selecting from the buffet of whatever is arising as the field of experience. I am a construct. Why? There is no end to this work of constructing. The thoughts that arise vanish by themselves. Even if I manage to select a beautiful pattern for a few moments, it dissolves. I am constructing myself. Now, if I really exist, I won't need to construct myself. So, if I find that I'm habitually and seemingly necessarily constructing myself, this is maybe a sign that I don't exist before the construction. The self is a work in progress. It's not something which already exists. So, when I do dharma practice, dharma activity, I'm developing my dharma self. And one of the painful things we come to realize as the years go by is that my dharma self is also impermanent. The enthusiasm that I had to do my practice every day and to keep studying somehow has faded away. This is wonderful because this is the teaching of the Buddha. All compounded things are impermanent. 
will vanish. Our concern then is to find the stillness, the silence, the infinity, which is always present and not touched or transformed by the flow of the finite. So, <clears throat> when, <clears throat> when we find ourselves getting pulled into <clears throat> a solid belief, which we can comment on, then whether that's about things that we take to be outside ourselves or think, or ourselves, you can see, oh, this is a formulation. Who or what is this formulation in the service of? Of myself. Whether I think I'm a bad person or a good person. As long as the personness, the essential meanness of this experience is unaltered, unawakened, oh, suffering arises from ignorance and grasping. The ignorance aspect is <clears throat> that we don't relax and open to the ungraspableness of our presence. I am not a thing. When I look for the thingness of myself, I find nothing. And yet I don't cease to exist. Each of us is here, sitting in our room. We are present. We have a body, breathing, looking, hearing. So I am a flow of experience, which seems to freeze into a thing. And this is a second aspect, the grasping. I, I do something. Afterwards, I think, oh, why did I do that? The moment of the action, maybe saying something unkind to someone, or some arising thoughts, and then some words coming out of my mouth. This was a flow. And the flow arose because of how I was perceiving the other person. But after I think, oh, I shouldn't have done that. So what is that? The speaking, the look on my face, the tone of my voice, all have vanished. But I'm carrying some kind of echo, some memory which condenses into that was wrong. It is wrong. There has to be an it. What I said. When I said it, there was a flow of saying. And now it's condensing, thickening into what I said. And this is very important for us in our meditation practice and in our, in our life. There is the how. This points to the tone of voice, eye contact, and so on. The condensation lies in the what. And the, the what is a conclusion. It's, it's an apprehension a grasping hold of the how, the flow. So when we read in the Buddhist text about the absence of inherent self-nature, the absence of a, an essential uh, truth or essence to anything, which we see especially from the time of the Heart Sutra and uh, Parjaparamita literature, nothing has happened. That is to say, flow has happened, a how of vibration of the voice, expression of the face, and so on, which in itself is ungraspable movement. But when I come to my conclusion, I shouldn't have done it. I am the agent. I am autonomous. I stand alone. I did it. Something happened. This is all interpretation. Whenever this kind of structure arises in your mind and you feel the pull into identification and solidification, try to just relax and stay present with the unfolding of this movement. This is movement appearing as if it was substance. 
which is why in Buddhism they have a, a lot of discussion about illusion. So a mirage that appears in the road arises due to the meeting of various kinds of movement. The heat of the sun is heating the surface of the road. This alters the way the, the air is uh, perceived and we experience the mirage. The mirage is the appearance of these moving factors. It appears to be something, but it's not something. You can't catch it. You can't put it in a box. It's just there in front of you under certain conditions. The fact that you can't catch it doesn't mean that it's nothing at all, because you can see it. It is an appearance which is empty. That is to say, we don't have to say either there is appearance or there is emptiness. It is both appearance and emptiness. There is no contradiction between the two. So when I think, oh, I'm a bad person, I shouldn't have said that. This is like a mirage. I can't just say, oh, everything is empty. It doesn't matter. It's true. It is just emptiness. But that would be to make the wisdom aspect that sees emptiness too extreme. On the other hand, the conclusion I'm coming to has no true essence to it. What I said was wrong. Where is this what you said? If, if it's really wrong and really bad, we get the police, they'll arrest this and put it in prison. What was said is ungraspable. It manifests and it's empty. So this is enormously important to really see. We are all addicted to having opinions. People have opinions about us. We have opinions about other people. They are impactful, but they don't establish any enduring truth. We can't say they're nothing at all, but neither are they real phenomena. So we follow the middle way, holding the tension between these two, between our participation, which is always formative in formation, taking on shape, and the actuality of what is our being in the world, which is the movement of emptiness. We take a break now for lunch until uh, half past one London time, which is half past two in Europe. And when you, whatever you do, try to observe the emergent quality of your participation in the environment and try to focus on perception. So rather than thinking maybe, oh, I need to eat something or I want to eat this specific thing, you can go in the kitchen and look what is there so that your behavior arises with the phenomena because when you, when you make plans about what you're going to do, this supports the fantasy of mastery. This is what I want, this is what I'm going to do. And so your concept arrives before your body. But if you let your body arrive in the kitchen and you open the fridge, something is going to say hello. So that's how you can allow the world to invite you forward then rather than you being the boss. Okay, so we have a break now for just over an hour. Have a good break. For each of us, we are sitting somewhere. We can identify that place in terms of a room or what's in the room or the town that the room is in and so on. So we can always find ourselves somewhere. If you go out of your house, you go to the shops or whatever you do, you're always somewhere. That somewhere is identified through the use of words, of naming, of concepts. And 
that kind of location is always relative to other places. So if I am in a park, I'm not at home. If I'm uh, in outside reading a book, I'm not inside on the computer. The specificity of the location is determined by the exclusion of the other potential uh, environments in which I might be. So if we look back over our lives, we have been in many, many different places. And because these places seem to have uh, some qualities uh, inherent in them, we can compare and contrast between places. This place is better than that place because I like this more than that. We are attributing values or in seemingly inherent qualities to a place and identifying them on the basis of our own feeling tone. But at the same time, I'm always here. And being here, what does it stand in relation to? Here is, is a, an unlocatable immediacy. Well, you might say there is a duality between here and not here. But you can look directly for yourself. Wherever you are at the moment, you're here. And then there are many places where you are not, which is not here for you. Now, the places that are not here for you, they have uh, kind of names that identify them. Uh, I'm not at the beach. I'm not in a cafe. If you have a favorite beach, when you mention its name, you imagine how the sand is and how maybe the rocks and the hills are, whatever it's like, you have a sense of the, the uniqueness of that place. There are all these infinite not here's. But where is here? Here in itself, not determined by uh, where it is not. The non-relativized here is just here. And this just here is with us wherever we are. So that's a very... Uh, interesting area to explore for yourself. How does here show itself to you? How is it revealed? Is it in the body? Is it something linked with what's around you? Or is it an immediacy of presence? I would suggest when you link to the body or the environment, it becomes relativized quite easily. Oh, if you just be with here, it is non-absence. When you think of not here, you become absent from the presence of here. Here is non-conceptual. Just as if you're walking along the road and you see a situation. As you go along, there is this and this and this and this. And then some, something seems to grasp your attention and you start to make your commentary about what you perceive. For example, in London, a lot of people are drinking alcohol and there's broken glass on the pavement. So it's quite easy, certainly for me, to have some opinion about broken bottles. I see something, what I see is this, this glass, this broken glass, this glass broken by stupid people, and then gradually more and more thoughts can develop from that. So as part of our practice, we, uh, we reflect on Dharma instruction in relation to ordinary life. So this is just the immediacy of what is arising. And if our senses are open and our mind is peaceful, it's just flowing through. But suddenly we find that this has become something. What's the difference? There is a sense of separateness with the something. This is just the non-duality of environmental showing and appreciation through the radiance of awareness. Each step you take, you're part of the unveiling. Because it's not this out there but all this at once, all this at onceness. 
and this is just flowing and flowing and flowing. And in the Indian traditions, there are many ways of looking at this. Sometimes it's taken up with I. I is everything. How is this possible? Because duality arises from, with the movement of the mind. When the mind doesn't move, even although there is movement through the mind, the, the circle is complete. So this has the same function as is. It's just this. But when this, when there is a kind of twist or turn, and there is an engagement both emerging into the situation and, and a stepping back, there is a fusion and a separation. Whoa, what's this? And our question is what? So again, we come into naming and division and building up the sense of what is there. Moment by moment in life, these two streams of possibility, this and something, are inseparable. Now, this is also the precisely the description that we read about the emergence of ignorance. So I'll say a little bit about that now. But the key thing is not to lose the sense that it is happening here and now, moment by moment. The basis of our experience is space. You need space for revelation, for showing. The world is showing, we are showing. We are the showings of the ground. At first, this just sounds like words. But once you start to open yourself to the direct presence of the ground, you see that the, when you look for this ground, the ground of your being, there is nothing you can find. And yet the showing is ceaseless. More and more and more, always something is arising. So although we use words like ground or base or source, <clears throat> it's not a basis on which things are stacked up. But it's the basis of the showing, which sometimes looks very small. Sometimes it's vast, including the sun and the moon. The mind doesn't have a fixed shape. It's hospitable to everything which arises as it arises. If you go to visit someone, they tend to invite you into a room. That is to say, you come in the front door and you are taken to some place. This precise location is limiting because the rest of the flat is not available to view. And this is the same with the invitation or the welcome that you get from the phenomena of the world. Or when I put on my shoes, the shoes give me a welcome, but they are also a formative shaping for the food, uh, facilitating certain kinds of movement and restricting others. So this, again, is something important for you to investigate. When you wear different clothes, when you sit in different seats in your house, when you use different kinds of cups and so on, in engaging with each of these formations, you are formed into a co-emergence with that formation. You both shape the shoes so that after some months they fit your feet in a different way, and they also shape your foot, maybe they rub on the heel and you start to get a, uh, some bone growth or whatever. We are shaping and we are shaped. You can think about that, walking in the country, getting on a bus. Space is not like this. The mind is not like this. The mind itself exerts no effort on any arising to be other than it is. So, we have this term, Zokpachembo, the great completion. It means everything is complete in emptiness. Complete means it's uh, unborn. So that even if it seems to manifest, it doesn't come out of emptiness. It's complete as it is. Now, that is the mind itself. That is the mind as a luminous, 
radiant awareness, which is the vehicle or the revealer of everything which occurs, is fully welcome as it is in that openness. So space and manifestation or form and emptiness, but formation and formation, they have opposition. Because when you place things close to each other, and they are, are either harmonic or disharmonic. Certain colors are harmonious, others are disharmonious. So you could choose clothes to, to see whether you want them to have a, a clash or whether you want them to work uh, in, in a collaborative way together. The mind itself, in being empty, is indestructible. It's called the Vajra or Dorji, which simply means something which, uh, the, which finds nothing stronger than it, so it can never be destroyed by anything. And the space of the mind is indestructible. It doesn't mean that it's very strong, in, like a tank. It's, it's indestructible because everything passes through it. It doesn't stand in opposition to anything. This open emptiness, which is inseparable from radiant awareness, is the basis of, of how we are. But, of course, we are also manifesting. Now, manifesting means we are influenced by what our environment. We behave differently on a hot summer's day from a cold winter's day. The food that's very appealing in wintertime is not what you want in the hot summer's day. That is to say, we are manifestations of the energy of the ground moving within a field of the manifestations of the energy of the ground. On the level of open awareness, when we're sitting, it doesn't matter what happens. Everything which occurs is impermanent. It's there and then it's gone. And we are here. And this here is simply open. We're not here in relation to any other place because here is not a place. Everything is passing through. But then when we get, come up from the sitting practice, we are moving in a world which influences us. Which means that we are in this realm of these uh, three moving elements, water, fire and wind. Of course, as they encounter the earth, earth is solid and not moving. So we, we are always having to balance between uh, water, fire, wind, and, and earth. So, for example, in the field of psychotherapy, there often arises the question from a, a patient who is in a relationship. My partner, he behaves in this way and that way. What should I do? This is a, an impossible question. Of course, they are trying to give an accurate description of this uh, person they are involved with so that they can understand how to have less suffering. What should I put up with? When should I leave? How can I know if I'm being too tolerant? I want to tell him to fuck off, but I don't want to be on my own. So this is what happens when we are involved with energy which has become thickened into uh, substance as that person and how I am. The problem that arises is that having concretized the situation, and having memories of their behavior and my behavior, and having predictions of their future behavior and mine also, I'm trying to adjust the variables in order to proceed in a way which is less painful, which would be fine if it was a, a game of chess. We know that there are not many squares on the chessboard, and yet there are many, many, many kind of games that can be played. But we are much less predictable than the chessboard and the pieces on the chest. We are shifting and turning moment by moment. Unstable, 
unreliable. Now we may decide I'm going to present myself as reliable and stable. And we will have some reason for behaving in this artificial way. The problem then for meditators is you are not allowing yourself to be present with energy as it is. Again, we seek the middle way. If you get trapped in strategic thinking, in working out how to manage the circumstances, there's no end to that engaged activity. On the other hand, if you just say, oh, I'll do whatever I feel like in a very spontaneous way, you're not likely to have much authentic contact with other people. The middle way begins with the whole. If you start with a part, you always go to an extreme. But here we are in the environment. Many factors are moving, having a sense of balance, moving with balance and grace in and through the various permutations which are manifesting. If you fall asleep, you get hurt. If you make it too real, you get hurt. If you just say, oh, it's an empty illusion, you also get hurt. In our manifestation, we are impacted very strongly by many things. If we really see and accept that life is impermanence, then mindfulness is just part of how we survive. Mindful of all the aspects arising in the field, in the whole. So somebody says something hurtful to me. I feel hurt or rejected. What does this mean? That would depend on my attachment. I am upset. Do I want to settle? Will thinking about being upset help me to settle? Yes, but if I don't really become clear about uh, what I feel, and tell the other person, they're going to upset me again. I'm going to give them some feedback. And then hopefully they will change. This is probably naive. But what am I supposed to do? Even if all the Buddhas of the three times met together and trained in marriage therapy, they wouldn't be able to give any useful advice. Life is a lonely business. The maps and the compass, they are abstractions. Moment by moment, we shift and move according to circumstances. Due to causes and conditions, to the way in which the uh, tendencies from our previous existences manifest, we may have easy relationships or difficult relationships. But it's terrible. I can't bear it. What should I do? This is not the right question. Because what implies that there is some definite thing which, if you do it, will make it better? So you decide, I've had enough. I'm leaving the sky. You break up. You feel relieved. And you're sitting in a cafe. And you watch him walking down the street with his arm around another woman. And you're upset. Why? You were so happy to be rid of this bastard. Do you mean you still love the bastard? This is our condition. This is why we have suffering in samsara. It's not that we don't, that we shouldn't be uh, relating to other people, but we have to be aware who is this other person? Are they a what or a who? or a how. If you can find them as a how, then probably life will be easier than you f if you think they are a who or a what. But I thought I knew him. Yeah, the because of suffering. How could he? Come ha potuto? Exactly. Sounds very good in Italian. <laughs> how could he? He shouldn't do that. He's not like that. This is because we are under the power of compounding, of seeing certain patterns, and undeniably there are patterns, but these are patterns of energy, of posture, gesture, breathing, and so on. 
They are not patterns of a person. In the Buddha's first teaching, he said that there is an absence of inherent existence in persons, in people. We see people, a baby, a man, a woman, and so on. Someone is there. And when we say someone, there's a sense of the singularity, a, a specificity. But the someone is our belief, our construction. The actuality is that the, the potential of the ground manifesting in the illusory form of this other is inseparable from the environment. And so they are influenced by many, many factors, some of which they are conscious of, but many they are not conscious of. When we sit doing a basic meditation, we find that our mind is very strange. There seems to be no particular order or value in the way the thoughts and feelings tumble along. How can I get up and <clears throat> go to work and be a, a kind of useful person if my mind is actually as strange and uh, non-rational as it appears to be? This is because our world is truly like a dream. This world arises for us according to our karma and the patterns which seem so important to us are determined by our own uh, tilt or twist of energetic formation. This world is too complicated to solve as if it was a problem because it's shifting all the time. But by participating, by entering into the field which is moving, we learn to live as impermanence, as flow. Okay, so we uh, take a break now for 20 minutes and then we'll continue with another two sessions. Okay. Okay, uh, so yes, although <coughs> the main focus is on uh, Sokshen, uh, we also helpful to look at different Buddhist ways of teaching. For example, in Dzogchen, they talk about um, having a body of light. What stops us having a body of light? This is done by having a body of stuff. And how this operates is explained by the Buddha in terms of the five uh, heaps or skandhas. These uh, five are the ways in which the deluded sense of a solid separate person comes into being. So. And the first is um, form, which is interpreted as shape and color. So when we look around, if we look at our window frame, it's a generally rectangular. Uh, a rectangle is a concept. We don't find rectangular shapes very much in nature. Plants are not rectangular. So shapes are concepts which we apply in order to organize um, the uh, light which is coming towards us. It's the same with color. As we know, people see colors in different ways. And when we see a color, maybe a red, some association arises in our mind. So one could be like, uh, I don't know, ox blood red, could be a color that Rembrandt used. So we see this inside a cultural context. So it's important when we look at this form, it, it, the meaning is form as it is for me. It's not the form of something truly existing out there all by itself. So form is always an interpretation. For example, in the back garden near where I live, there are some robins that have made their nest in a big bush. I see a surface of leaves. But when I watch the robin flying into them, it finds a way through the leaves. It's a wall of green for me, and for the robin, it's a little road. So we come back to this basic principle. The world is revealed to us through the modality of our participation. 
Then the second uh, of these uh, skandhas is um, kind of sensation feeling. It's basically liking, not liking, and indifferent. And this carries with it its uh, objectifying aspect. So when I have a feeling I like, the objective correlate is this is good. And if I don't like it, the objective correlate is this is not good. Both of these are movements of the mind. And that's uh, the, the quality of participation. When I was young, I was swimming all the time. And now sometimes if I go to the sea, I just look at it. I could go in swimming, but I just look at the waves. So we can see through time our relation to different colors, people, foods, aspects of the environment alter. So the attribution of positive, negative, and neutral is contextual. It's not something fixed. And the, the third aspect is um, often translated as perception. In Tibetan, it's called uh, duche, which means to, to know how to gather. It's like having a recipe. You want to make a, a cake. So what kind of flour you will use? Are you going to put some uh, almonds? That will depend on the recipe you have in your mind. And this indicates that as we move towards the environment, we see all these potential ingredients. But according to our recipe, some become very important and others are not at all important. So we are organizing what is arising for us. And as you will see, the more we move through these five skandhas or five heaps of potentials, the more mental activity is being massaged into the raw material of the world, the raw ingredient of the world. So we're starting to <clears throat> form the sense that this is something knowable. And then the, the fourth uh, of these uh, heaps is uh, samskara in Sanskrit means uh, to, to bring together. So it's not just bringing together, but it's acting on them to make something to, and, and to make something of them. So in, in that sense, the initial sense is like some light or sound. At first, I'm thinking, what is that? And now it's more, what is this for me? Well, this uh, fourth skanda is very strongly connected with the idea of karma. It's how you formulate yourself in relation to the potential of the situation. For example, I'm walking down the street. You're in front of me. You put your hand in your pocket to pull out a handkerchief and the 20 euro note falls on the pavement. So according to this um, formative focus, do I shout out to you, hey, you dropped your money? Or perhaps I just go and quickly pick it up and put it in my pocket. Or perhaps I put my foot on the note and bend down as if to tie my shoelace and then take the money in a hidden way. So how I make sense of the potential of the situation is depending on shapings from the past. Now, clearly there are many different options available in a situation like that. But the choice that manifests through me tends to happen very quickly. We're usually not thinking, should I do this, should I do that? we find ourselves doing something. That is to say that this formation of oneself arises as the truth of one's being. It feels like me. And then the fifth of these uh, aspects is uh, normally translated as consciousness. It means knowing something. I now have a definite knowledge. There is something that I know. So there is me, because every act of consciousness is also self-conscious. I don't just know that two and two equals four, but when I say two and two equals four, I know that I know this. So this is an important double move in confirming the object, I confirm the subject. 
So this is the dynamic that is maintaining the duality, the seeming separation of self and other as two independent domains. And with this consciousness, I, <clears throat> I move in the world with my knowledge of how things are. I am confirmed in myself. So this is how we are born as a mental being. It is the collaboration of these five aspects which generates our ongoing sense of, oh, this is who I am. We look at how other people behave and we think, oh, I couldn't do that. Somehow it's possible for them. In fact, I know how it is possible for them because they are not me. There is something about them that makes it possible for them to do this. So that is very important because now I've got a sense of some inherent difference between me and the other person. I'm not like you because I'm like me. So I am now a, a patterning, a patterning which I take to be me, which gives me a sense of continuity through time. But because this pattern is ceaselessly interacting with the environment, it's very vulnerable. So here we see this uh, tension between the fact of impermanence, the fact of dependent origination, that, that we emerge or arise in situations in dialogue with whatever else is going on. And yet, I feel like someone. I am me, but I'm changed by events, and permanent and impermanent. So this is very helpful to look at. Okay, so what is impermanent about me? We've already looked, sensations, thoughts, memories, arising and passing and so on. So, and on the other side, what is permanent about me? This is the idea that I exist. That's all. Everything else is moving. If I start to say anything about how I exist, I find it's not accurate. So maybe I exist as someone who's thirsty, and then I'm not thirsty, or I'm full of energy, and then I'm very tired. So my qualities of being me are impermanent. The only thing is I am me. That's all I have. And if I look, who is the one who is me? It can't be my qualities. It can't be my age. It can't be what I know, or what I eat, or what I do, because these all change according to the years. So when we take this question, who am I, and we stay with it, then in the flow of experience, all kinds of um, indications or answers arise. I am a Buddhist. That doesn't last very long because now I am a coffee drinker. Perhaps there's a specific Buddhist way of drinking coffee, but I didn't get that initiation yet. So I drink coffee as a coffee drinker. So moment by moment, our identity system is emptying out and filling up, emptying out, filling up. Who am I? I am whoever is arising at this moment but it won't be true necessarily in the next moment. So who am I? This. What is the content of this? There is this before content and there is this with content. This is like the mirror. The mirror itself has nothing, but due to causes and conditions, it shows a reflection. So this or I, we can't find anything. It has no fixed content. But at the same time, it always seems to have some content. Its content is unreliable, but actual. So here we are at the, the central point. I am empty and full, but I'm not full of me. So what am I full of? What is arising? And at the moment it's arising for me, this is me. So if I say, um, I'm tired, this is true and not true. 
It's true because I'm a little bit tired, but it's not true in that it's not a universal definition of who I am. It is part of the portfolio or the potential of aspects. So I feel a little bit tired because I find this Zoom system uh, not very energizing in itself. After some time we finish and I go for a walk outside. The sun is shining, the trees are gleaming. Energy will flow from the rays of the sun, from the wind. Energy. Oh, so it's like that. This is why the image of the mirror is used so often. I'm empty, empty of self, empty of me. And I'm full of not me, which is me. This is strange. But it's how it is. I remember walking in the hills in India, especially in the afternoon when it's very hot. This, the rocks look as if they're vibrating. The shadows are so dark. That was me. It's not that I'm looking at the rock. The rock is me. The sky is me. The, the way the birds are flying is me. That might sound mad and omnipotent. My mind is full of this amazing sky. This is me. It's not the me that can think, oh, this is a nice place. The me of a judgment or a conclusion, an opinion. Then I have a self. I am the one who likes this or doesn't like this. And my access to this beautiful mountain is very limited. But when I take the content of my likes and dislikes out, when I release them and let them dissolve, there's space. Space for the rocks and the trees and the birds and the sky. The mind itself is not a thing. The self is not a thing, but it pretends to be a thing. So we have to look again and again in this way. The process of the day is the birth and death of yourself a thousand times. So when you really look, <clears throat> and you might, you might suddenly feel, oh, I'm so hungry. This becomes the central uh, experience or a taste for your m life at that moment. But you weren't hung aware of being hungry before. This uh, sensation idea is suddenly filling the space of your existence. It is me and it isn't me. So can I be hungry without being hungry? When you feel really hungry, you tend to eat too much because hunger is hunger. If you can see the shape of it, the dynamic of it, then it's just this. But I am really hungry. Then hunger becomes the self. The self fills with hunger. The self can fill with anger. So in America, in the last days, they've had a lot of rioting with people setting fire to houses and burning shops and so on. So there was the outrageous murder of a man. And people feel angry. But then they become angry. We know what that's like. It's not a, an optional add-on your clarity with regard to it diminishes and it occupies the whole of you. So we want to see this in relation to the mirror. Awareness as the mirror fills and empties. The ego fills, but there is some clinging there, some identification, some fusion. Some people get preoccupied with jealousy or pride, desires. So it's important to see the difference between awareness and the ego self is that although both are empty, the mirror has no need to uh, be full or empty. And in itself, it's not improved or um, denigrated by the quality of the reflection. 
the reflection arises and passes. But in our ego self, it's not like that. Although everything that we as an ego self fill with will empty out, we build on it as if it would be able to provide us with a basis of proceeding. So I'm aware of anger. I am angry. It's the same anger. What has been added is identification, like a snail finding a shell. We seem to have gained the protective uh, enclosure of something definite. So this is why uh, the reflection on impermanence is so important. Because I'm angry with you, but you don't always make me angry. So it's not that you as some eternal person always makes me angry. But in this particular moment, you make me angry. I'm angry with you. And I'm not always angry with you. So you are impermanently provocative. And I am impermanently pissed off. So who am I angry with? But when we get angry, it doesn't feel like that. So the missing ingredient, of course, is energy. Energy manifests as attachment, where we can almost feel our mind like a claw pulling in whatever is occurring. But the energy also arises as the wind in our uh, in energy system. Through the course of the day, the, our prana, our life energy is moving across desire and aversion. In the yoga tradition, Generally, they say every four hours, the prana is moving across the two side channels, the solar and the lunar. And this brings a certain shift in how we organize our experience of what's occurring. So the solar and lunar is like going back to the second skanda where you have positive, negative and neutral. And the desire in yoga is to bring the energy into the central channel which is neutral, which is emptiness. Now, where is this channel? Different texts give different descriptions of its color and so on, but usually it's seen as running on the front side of the spinal column. And the two side channels join into it near the base. But actually the central channel is the entirety of the universe. Central channel is inseparable from the Dharma Dhatu, the space of all phenomena. So when you get angry or when you feel jealousy or um, lazy or you hate yourself, there's no need to artificially try to direct the energy to release it without affirmation, without um, any kind of fixing or approval, energy will dissolve by itself. So we are angry. Now the other person doesn't like us. Who is it they don't like? The person who was very angry. Where is that person? Are you angry now? No. But you were really angry yesterday. I can't forgive that. You made me so unhappy. Who made you unhappy? Okay, we're going to go to the police station. And I, I will make a confession on behalf of my doppelganger. And I will, I will say to the policeman, please arrest my yesterday self. That guy is a real bastard. I'm a nice person. I don't want to have to hang out with him. You, you arrest him and put him in the prison. This is, this is the problem for the ego. The party is over. The event has gone by. But the echo of the event, the taste, the trace of the event seems to linger. And so we build up images of who the other person is. And this then predisposes us to understand them in a particular way based on the past. The event has gone. Oh, but surely actions should have consequences. 
we can't let people get away with it. But this is uh, where the understanding of karma is very important. If you murder someone and you, you don't feel any remorse, if you are arrested and sent to prison for 25 years, unless your mind changes, these 25 years in prison will not soften your karmic result from the murder. Karma is the, the fact that there is an event and it has a consequence which comes later. It's not about the immediate result. After the murder, if the police arrest me, this is not a karmic consequence. So if you really start to see how karma operates, you don't have to be the one who punishes other people. People do all kinds of things we don't like. Our issue is, why am I reacting? I can't control their behavior. But I can release this sequence of negative thoughts and feelings and so on as they arise in the mind. Otherwise, we have two negatives. Someone behaves in a way that you think is bad. You decide they are really bad. This is a terrible person. Now you have made yourself more stupid. Who did the bad thing? The five skandhas which generate the illusion of a self. But does that mean that nobody does anything bad? In samsara, inside the logic of duality, of course people do bad things. But from the very beginning, everything has been unborn. And there are patterns. We are the pattern of the radiance of the light of the ground. And the ground is indestructible. In the autumn, the plants die off, but the ground is still there. So it's very important to investigate for yourself <clears throat> when you have a strong opinion about something. So if we have a question, is Mr. Trump good or bad? He is neither good nor bad, nor both good and bad, and uh, neither good nor bad. Mr. Trump is empty of inherent existence. Well, this is very challenging. In our uh, bad things happen across the world all the time. Mr. Trump supports Saudi Arabia, which every day is bombing in Yemen. They attack the hospitals. They're cruel. Who is cruel? They are cruel. Who are they? This is where your mind is. There are good people and bad people. We want to have a good world. We all know there is only one quick way to do this. We have to kill all the bad people. So we have to join together as a secret cult of Buddhist assassins. And when all the Bad people are killed, the Buddhas will arrive and they throw flowers in the air and we're all happy and Bambi will come out of the forest. So clearly killing the bad, it doesn't make for good. So the reason I'm stressing this is to try to help you <clears throat> see that the, the logic of the ego and the logic of awareness are very, very different. So... If you're going to approach the world from the point of view of the open awareness, which is a view of non-duality, this is difficult to uh, understand if you mix it with the interpretive mode of duality. Okay, so we have a, a break now for 20 minutes and then we come to our last session today. And of course, you know, I've suggested at various times things for you to reflect on or to practice. This is the practice you have to do. Otherwise, this is just a lot of words. Okay, so we meet again at uh, quarter past four. So what I was saying about the, the central channel and its equivalence with the Dharma Datu is important for practice. Because there are two main approaches to practice, which we've already touched on a little bit. 
either we think that we are outside trying to get in or that we are already in but a bit forgetful. So if you start from the position of being apart, being a separate entity, then the question is, well, how can I awaken or how can I reach enlightenment? I'm the wrong kind of person in the wrong place. If I was a better kind of person, it would be easier. But I'm me. So what to do? It's not a very energizing kind of reflection. But of course, we have many, many practices like that. May I be reborn in Dewa Chen? May I do save all sentient beings and so on? There's nothing wrong with any of these practices. But you have to see the basic assumption which is embedded inside them. So the view of Shen says from the very beginning, the quality of our mind, the true quality of the mind, which is awareness, is inseparable from the ground. That the quality of the Buddha and our basic quality is the same. We are already within the realm of clarity. Our senses tell us this, if we can listen. What we see is light. What we hear is sound. Sense come and dissolve. Sensation is dissolving. If we run our hand across our arm, we find the sensation arises and passes. And the same with the taste in the mouth. These are flows of experience, always moving. So we are in the midst of a field of movement. This has always been there. Now, we in this life are born with a human body. This has some advantages. We can have an education and develop our intelligence. But we also become tilted in the direction of interpretation. And so the self-liberating simplicity of light and sound and taste and smell and touch is obscured by our own capacity to interpret. We want to know what it is. You go walking in the forest and you hear a sound, you hear the sound, but that's not enough. What was that? Oh, maybe an owl, maybe a cuckoo. What has this got to do with the bird? The bird is not called cuckoo. You don't hear birds saying, hello, cuckoo. The sheep don't say, hello, cuckoo. We say, hello, cuckoo. Cuckoo tells us about us, not about the bird. So you already heard the sound. Is that enough? Why not? But I need to know what it is. This is really interesting. When I get home, I'm going to kind of go on the computer and see, listen to bird songs, see and I can identify it. In the search for more, we get less. Because instead of getting more of the bird, we get less of the bird because we've created a wall between us and the bird, and we get more of ourselves. But when we look in our Dharma books, it doesn't say the path to enlightenment is to get more self. That you, in order to get enlightened, you have to get more self. So this is... Uh, this is very important. The ego wants this kind of information because it's using it to build and maintain its sense of self. It is a construction. If you're building a house with bricks, you need to have cement. So when we build the edifice of the self, we are cementing all these different pieces together to make this construct. Why would we do this? It's better to have more. But if everything is empty, all you have is more emptiness. Now, you have one gram of emptiness and you have 10 grams of emptiness. Which weighs more? This is the kind of question that teachers used to torture children. 
there is no way to emptiness. Is a big emptiness better than a small emptiness? No difference. We are already within the mandala of all the Buddhas. Everything is empty and radiant. So in the Soksen teachings, it says that the, the, the ground manifests as uh, light and rays of light and sound. And so this is what is arising. So when you're in the forest, there is a sound. What is that? It's the ground. You see this tree, you see that other tree, they look very different. Are they different? No, because this is the light of the ground. You cannot see a tree. Repeat after me, I cannot see a tree. You think tree. You identify tree. You name the tree. You see light. You see color. There's nothing wrong with identifying this is an oak tree. But when you see the oak tree, this is uh, Kuntu Zangpo uh, Yab Yum, Kuntu Zangpo with his partner, and Kuntu Zang Mo. So they come together, they are in sexual union. This symbolizes the inseparability of appearance, which is light or sound. And what we do with it, compassion, how it gets molded. So in the human realm, we learn this is an oak tree, this is a beech tree. This allows us to participate in the world with other people. But these are only names. There is no essential truth in them. There is nothing to grasp. When you grasp, you get less. When you receive, you get more. What do you get? More emptiness, which is radiant, joyful, and showing patterns. None of these things you can grasp. There is nothing to get. Inside our cultural formation, we have many ways of evaluating people by their money, their beauty, their physical strength. These are ideas, interpretations. Actually, everything is empty. So, when we're moving in the world, experience after experience is arising. When you want to think about something, you split the world. Because when you start to think and you go into your thinking self, it's very easy to lose the field that you're in, the arena of experience. So we want to be open and allow the thought to arise. Non-duality means that it's never either or. It's always both and. So the openness and the thought, the openness and the feeling are not in opposition. So here each of us is in our funny little life, full of our disappointments and confusions. How come my life has ended up like this? That is a thought. The thought arises. Who is the thought telling us about? It's just a thought. It's like reading a play. In the play, there are different voices, different characters. If you are an actor, you might be thinking, oh, I would like to play that. This is how I would get into that role. I would be on the stage. And it would be as if I was that person. I would be so good at pretending to be that person. People would believe I was that person. But this is the same for us. We are so good at pretending to be ourselves. Even our mother believes that we are that person. But it's theater. It is make-believe. Illusion. It's not so serious. It doesn't mean it's nothing at all. But it's not so important. So if we hold our life in a light way, 
Sometimes days are easy, sometimes they're difficult. You can have problems of money, problems of health, problems of friendship. These arise and then they pass. As we've already looked, it is as if they are me, but they are not truly defining of me because there is no one to be truly defined. This is the great mystery that it is as if we are this limited finite being and through <clears throat> having a, a sense of the shape of our identity we could be clearly defined and yet the definition is never final we are beyond totalization there's always something more this is the sign of our potential all kinds of feelings, thoughts, memories. You might be happy about how your children are growing up. Then one of them gets in some trouble. Then your mind goes off on another road. Oh, I should have behaved differently with them when they were 14. Why didn't I take more care? Now a whole new version of your own history is arising. This is the sign of the energy of the arising from the potential of the ground so we have to take this very 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 gently when we feel i'm useless i've made a mess of things this is not the voice of truth about some essence this is simply a new character in the drama of your life yesterday you were mrs sad now you're Mrs. Fuck Up. This, this play could get quite interesting. There are thousands of versions of you. So when you think, oh, I have to sort myself out, this is uh, an impossible task. There is not something there to be sorted out. But it's like, how do you whistle for the wind? You can learn how to do that. They do it in the countryside. In the tantric texts, we invite, for example, Padma Sambhava to come. We know that if we invite him, he will come. Have your ordinary life. You've been busy at work in the day, and then in the evening you do some practice. And so you, you sing, uh, wake up, Padma Sambhava. Get up, come here. And then you tell him how he has to come, dancing and singing, because you are going to be very happy to see me. This is the basis of Tantra. Only invite people who like you. So you evoke, you call out Padma Sambhava. So when you have a lot of regret, when you judge yourself harshly, who are you inviting? Padma Sambhava has very big ears, so he can hear this. Huh? Nothing to do with me. My name is born from a lotus. And this person is inviting born from shit. Hmm. Oh, why did I do that? I'm always so unsuccessful. I must try harder. I'm so sorry. Oh, please forgive me. Now, what is the difference from born from a lotus and born from shit? None whatsoever. Both are arising from the pure ground. When you hate yourself, when you despair of yourself, I am born from rubbish, from ignorance, from the five poisons. This is a story. So pick up samsara play number one. In the northwest corner of the land of Kaka. <laughs> like that, you invent some story for yourself. What is happening? You're telling yourself a story and falling into it. Now, if you want to be a comedian, you have to learn not to laugh at your own jokes. So you don't want to fall into this story. 
It's sound and emptiness, thought and emptiness, memory and emptiness. No, I really, no, I really made a mistake. This is amazing. Everything is empty. All that the Buddhas can do is send out rays of light, but you manage to make a real mistake. Nobody has managed that from the beginning of time. All forms are empty. All compounded things are impermanent. There is, there is no individual essence to anything. But you made a real mistake. Even the Buddha say ignorance is a delusion, an illusion. It's not real. You have to be really, really deluded to believe that the illusion is real. It's not so serious. Whatever you use to define yourself becomes an attempt to exclude yourself from the Dharma Dhatu which you are already in. The ground is inclusive. All sentient beings are the energy of the ground. These are patterns of movement, whether it's cows or elephants or snakes. You say this is good, you say this is bad. But you don't recognize that you are playing with the content of your mind. This is your imagination. I'm a wonderful person. I'm a terrible person. These are ideas. It's just when you sit very quietly, you don't need to try to do any formal meditation. You just sit and be with your mind. Thoughts arise. What do they mean? If you leave them alone, they just go. If you imagine that it's your thought or this thought is telling you something about you, then you pick it up. So now you are being defined by a thought which is vanishing. The thought says, I'm stupid, I made a big mistake. Who is this referring to? Who is this I? We can look for ourselves. I is full of happy thoughts, then it is empty, then it fills with sad thoughts. When the sad thought comes, they seem to be speaking to some essence of sadness. But as we look before today, it is by the thought that I am feeling so sad that the sadness is consolidated. So this uh, ungraspable sensation, feeling quality of sadness gets wrapped in the binding of the concept, I feel so sad. But this is being created now according to your participation. You are calling this aspect into manifestation. Oh, in the Tibetan tradition, people say a lot of prayers, a lot of mantras. They had prayer wheels, money walls, and so on. Because they were wanting to call that quality, that shining radiant quality, into their world. So, for example, we say Lama Kieno. In Guru, uh, don't separate from me, include me, keep me in your mind, keep me in your heart. Otherwise, I'm wandering in samsara here and there, looking for happiness, making mistakes, getting lost. But where is samsara? It's inside the Dharma Dhatu. It's the, it's the domain of all the Buddhas. The Dharma Dhatu looks like samsara when you take it the wrong way. So. Here is a nice tree growing in your garden. As we looked, it's just light. But you take it as my tree. And now someone has cut a branch off my tree. Now I'm angry. This is terrible. How is it possible to do this to my tree? If they want to cut a tree, they should cut their own tree. But it's light. Look at the stump of the tree, where they, cut, where they cut off the, fascinating. Now the liquid is oozing out of this wound, how it gleams in the light. It's showing me it is light. What do I say? Shut up, 
tree. I'm going to tell you what you are. And this is big stupid. The world is shining, bright, inclusive, full of possibilities of movement. But it's not quite the way I wanted it. And my ideas are very important. In fact, I am very important. And if the world doesn't fit in with my idea, I will be upset. When you start to watch your own mind, you will realize that you are completely insane. This omnipotent fantasy, ego king of the world. This is the recipe for disappointment and sadness and grief. So in the text it says, whatever comes, comes. Because everything is impermanent and interactive and changing, don't limit yourself by formulating great plans for the future. We don't know. We don't know. So if you're trying to guess what might happen, you've entered a labyrinth of thoughts and projections. So the texts say, relax into the openness of the mirror. So sit in a simple way with your skeleton holding your weight. You don't need to do anything artificial. There's no meditation to enter into. You just sit with whatever is occurring. The sounds, sensations, and so on. Welcome. This. Just this. Some a new pattern arises. This. This. This is complete as this. If you grasp it with your concept, you tear it out of its living environment, and then you can compare and contrast it with something else. As we know, some uh, cultures in uh, South America used to use human sacrifice, cutting out the heart, cut into the chest and pull out the heart. Look, it's still beating the living heart. Yeah, not for very long. Luckily, we have a lot of people to kill today. If you take the heart out, the body dies and the heart dies. And, and if you look at the dead heart, it's not exactly how the heart is when it's in the body. When, when, the, when the liver is in the body, it's functioning. If you cut the liver out of the body and put it on a tray, it's just a piece of meat. So when we're sitting in the practice and we catch a thought, the thought is in the flow of life. It shows itself in its flow. It's part of the flow. So if you tear it out of the flow to look at it, this is a violence. It, it creates something artificial. This is why the instruction is don't interfere. Don't attribute value to whatever is arising. Simply sit relaxed and open and don't interfere. And this is the, the great paradox. The less you do, the more is there. The more you interfere with your mind, the more you try to make it according to some template or recipe, you find yourself stuck in the same neurotic formation. If you just relax and don't interfere, don't do anything, you're just there, like the mirror, simply showing or displaying whatever is arising, you become aware that your mind is vast. It has enough space for everything just as it is. And when you see directly the impermanence of each thing which is arising. It is what it is, and then it's gone. This is its great completion. Each moment is complete and whole in itself. So there is no need to do anything with it. 
nothing needs to be improved. Now, this becomes a little bit more difficult when you get up from the meditation. Because you walk down the street, you see buildings, you recognize them. They were there yesterday. They don't seem to be impermanent. That man always parks his car just there. I know that. I've seen it before. But what do we see? Do we see what is there? Or are we seeing what we imagine? The light today is at a particular angle. In London, the sky is blue, but there's a slight haze through it. So if I look out the window and I see the bricks on the building across from me, I can see this, or I can see this building, or I can see this building I've seen before. This building, which I've seen before, which is always the same building. But what is this? You can't say. When I look, there's on the front of a building, there are many, many bricks, and the sun is on the tiles on the roof. When I simply receive what is coming to me, I receive it all with gratitude. But when I try to say what it is, I cannot do that without violence because I have to compose for myself my building, which is over there. What is important for me? The building for me is about me. The, bu the building as itself is just the building. And if we take building out of that, because that is also my construction, my interpretation. There is this. What is this? Wrong question. Thought will invite thought. Thought will, thought will invite thought. We want to ask how. How takes me to this? So this is our practice. It's not very complicated. But it's difficult to do because we have made ourselves so big and important we can't get through the small door to ourselves by being no one nowhere in silence you become so small that you're reborn as everything but if we hold on to our own opinion as the central point then we start with the finite the known and we find it very difficult to get beyond that so oh, if we just take this uh, theme of impermanence and bring it into awareness moment by moment, we start to see the actuality of everything is impermanent. But when we take hold of the world through concepts, the false permanent is born. So our practice is to release ourselves from our addiction to concepts. And this is not something you can do in a hurry. Again and again, you let go. When you find yourself binding into a thought or a belief or a conclusion, we release and relax. We do this for days and months and years. And then life becomes much easier. Okay, so now we uh, come to the end for today. We have a few, a uh, couple more events uh, lined up that are uh, in, to get information on the website. I would like to thank you all for your attention and your interest in Dharma, which is a wonderful thing. And to thank uh, Giovanna for her translation, which is very easy for me to work with. And thank you to Milton and Jao for uh, setting up this uh, Zoom system for us. And also to Pedro, who will be preparing the recording uh, so that if, if you want to, you can listen again or share it with some friends. So I wish you a good evening and uh, good luck with your practice. Bye for now. Thank you, Jao. Bye. Bye-bye.
Bye, Bye James. Bye. Thank you very much. Grazie, Hilana. Grazie, James. Thank you. 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 Thank Bye. Bye. Devo, devo che ci sarà prossimamente. Bye. Grazie mille a tutti lì presente. Ci sarà un altro incontro presto presto, vero? <laughs> yeah, well, there, is, there, there is one in a couple Bye. of weeks, only in English, and then we have one with German, Spanish and Portuguese at the beginning of July. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye. See you soon then. Bye. Thank you, James. Giovanni, tradurre. Devi tradurre. Muchas gracias. Who is taking me? Yeah. In German also. Yeah. Hello, people. UK. So, yeah. okay. how nice to see you. So, pleasure to meet with you. And now we have uh, two people from uh, Turkey showing some interest, and we have translations into Turkey. <laughs> so, the great <laughs> deal of Dharma is rolling everywhere. Oh, oh, wonderful. Wow. Wonderful. Yes, thank you. Bye bye. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Bye bye then. Bye bye. Bye, bye. 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 Thanks, Thanks very much. Appreciate it. See you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Enjoy your evening. <laughs>